Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you back. Uh, glad to see you're all still here. I was kind of, you know, I, I had to leave uh, to go to some meetings, and it's a beautiful day out, and it's a Friday, and I did kind of think, I wonder if some people are going to bail, and it's going to look a little thinner when I get there, but it's good to see everybody is still here. So, as uh, my esteemed uh, introduction, introductor or MC um, already shared with you, my role to Dean is really atypical. I, it was interesting, you know, I kind of came in during the prior presentation and in all transparency didn't know most of what he was talking about because I didn't study um, any of this. And so what I, you know, in thinking about the speech, um, you know, you, I kind of use the adage, I don't know, you know, many of you in here might be technical. You may be the ones that actually make the sausage, I didn't know how the sausage was made, right? What I would, in the course of my career, what I'd like to share with you is how once I got that information that would be aggregated by the analysts, how we used it in application, in sports, in entertainment, et cetera, um, which is why I think the title today of Analytics Everywhere is so interesting, um, because a lot of what you see um, is put there because of analytics and maybe you didn't realize it. So I look forward to sharing some of those things um, with you. We can skip that part. All right, so for example, I'm gonna talk about three kind of main pillars when we talk about sports um, and how we use the data as a sports agency. Now, my, when I started my company, the primary function was representing individual athletes and I was primarily focused on golf. So when you would see a golfer and he or she would have on a particular logo on a hat, a shirt, bag, or was using a particular product, all of those decisions, while some of them may be driven by, I can play best with this ball, many or some of those decisions were also driven by the analytics of what the architecture of that deal looked like. But in sports, uh, okay, so for example, who knows the gentleman's name that's over recognition is? And the middle person is, and the far under representation she is. Okay, so would you agree that all of these athletes transcend their sports, right? You see any of them on a bevy of commercials, there's already value in it. You already know who they are, you can kind of recognize the name, you understand that it gives a credibility to the product. But when you think about it, there's a whole lot of athletes and frankly entertainers out there that don't have that sort of name recognition, that immediate recognition that um, kind of attributes value to whatever that relationship is. It's those relationships where data actually plays the most significant part. So the first thing I wanna talk about with that is the names and numbers, right? So for example, you have a, when I started in golf, um, and, and my timing was actually um, really fortuitous because I founded my agency, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1997, which if any of you golf fans out there, that happened to coincide with a newcomer in golf and his name is Tiger Woods. So Tiger, the Tiger effect, as it were, changed the demographic of who was watching golf. And so suddenly it went from being a predominantly middle-aged white male sport to something that appealed to younger generations, um, diverse ethnicities, and, and even actually brought women, women's attention into the sport. His effect changed the way the numbers worked, not only for him, but for all the players in it, because the dynamic of the viewership and how those um, numbers, those logos that you see influence buying behavior changed along with it. So what we would, when I, when I first started in, in my company, before I sold to William Morris IMG, um, the space or the sports landscape space was much more narrow than it is now. There wasn't the on-demand that you could get by watching certain holes. Esports was not really a thing yet. So the data that I needed then was less complicated than the data I needed 20 years into my career. But we still relied on 
being able to run a certain amount of, or there were services that we would use when I had my own company that would give us a certain amount of information for us to be able to calibrate what, for example, an equipment deal would be for somebody that, while he or she played on a professional tour, was not as recognizable as a Tiger or in this uh, situation as a Rory McIlroy. That was more in the infancy of names versus numbers and how we kind of navigated. And like I said, I wasn't the one making the sausage. We were just using it to help formulate and put some structure around how we valued a player in sports. Some of those ways that would occur, for example, um, the first thing you see there is called paying for the count. That was, or is, a term we used in golf that most people don't realize, but I think it's interesting and probably ap applicable in other areas that we use data. Every player on the PGA Tour um, got played to pay, excuse me, got paid to play a particular brand of golf ball, right? And so, for example, if, and I'll give you real life numbers, if you were a no name and just happened to get your playing card and you decided to play the Titleist golf ball, your equipment contract for that ball to use for a year would be about $100,000. So you sit here and wonder and say, okay, well, Joe Schmo plays this golf ball. Is he really selling $100,000 worth of that product? The answer to that is no. But what Titleist was doing was doing something called paying for the count. And so what they would do is they would go out and offer as much as they could because then they could advertise we're the number one golf ball on tour. So while Joe Schmo's $100,000 contract might not move the needle, 20 Joe Schmo contracts would. But once again, it was a data analysis. And, and I remember I would talk to a lot of my friends and they'd say, why does that guy get a deal? Or why does she get a deal? Or nobody knows who that person is. It was because it was all about the count and the influence of what that would do to your decision to buy that product. Um, because I can tell you from personal experience, you can play the same product a pro is playing. It doesn't change your game. <laughs> but... If you thought the majority played it and you're like, well, you know, gosh, that's the number one ball on tour, I'm going to go ahead and do that, that was, that's what would happen. Another thing that they would do out on tour, and again, this is probably, and Mike would certainly know this more in team sports, I could, I'm just speaking in terms of with golf, um, there would be a survey that would go out every week on the PGA Tour. And so before a player would tee off, the survey would go and they'd count clubs. They'd say there's this brand of driver, there's this brand of fairway wood, there's this brand of putter, and they would get all of that data together, aggregate it, and then feed it to the various companies. Because once again, if a company could say we owned the count in drivers, they frame an advertising campaign around this, push it out, and suddenly the driver sales would spike. So it was... Um, interesting and um, I guess frankly somewhat manipulative because I saw it from the other side and I saw how all of these um, sort of ways that the data was used, whether it was for us when we were structuring a deal or the television when they were producing and showing in certain players was all aimed at the end of the day to get you to see a particular product displayed and for you to buy it. Um, because again, and as I'm sure Mike will agree with me, sports was, was really about moving that needle and getting product sold. Um, same thing with selling tickets uh, to certain events. A lot of the data and how much tickets would go for would fluctuate, especially on the, the aftermarket, depending on who made the cut, um, who was in the playing field, how many strokes back were they. And so again, it was all a calculation of data that we would get to know how to price certain things for certain events. Um, licensing good, merchandising, all functions of things we would get back saying what a particular player's popularity was or wasn't and what areas we should market and how to go or how to roll it out to market to get the largest amount of hits, to sell the most amount of products, to return the biggest amount of royalties to the player. Again, all of that kind of compiled by the sausage that, that we got. Once I sold the, um, the company to William Morris, so 
I had had it for 17 years. William Morris uh, was a famed Hollywood agency. They had just purchased uh, for a couple billion dollars IMG, which is the worldwide conglomerate in sports. And then they kind of went on a buying spree and they bought UFC, they bought New York Fashion Week, they bought Miss Universe, they bought professional bull riding, and IMG also gave them a host of other verticals in sports. The reason I share that information with you is it's one of the things I learned going through my career is that I then saw not only the data that was used in golf, but I saw how the data used across a number of these verticals in entertainment and how we would place certain products, certain cameos in movies, certain book launches, all of these things calculated based on the data of it could be how well a person was playing, um, what their social media footprint was, where their social media footprint was, um, what products they were affiliated with, how those products were selling. And IMG or Endeavor as the parent company had a battery of sports and fashion and movie and, and just about every vertical you could think of of folks that sat in analytics that compiled all of these things for us Fortunately, they, they, they compiled it for me on Excel. I don't know how to use it. But they would give us those spreadsheets to be able to structure and analyze this data. So when looking at things and saying, OK, well, I have this particular basketball player, or I have this particular golfer, and he, he or she is going to do a cameo, and they're going to wear this particular product, um, and they're going to have this particular brand of cologne, and it's going to be pushed out on this type of social media channel. Because by then, the landscape had changed. You know, when I told you when I first started sports, or in sports, I still had the three networks, and we still had ESPN, but Golf Channel, NFL Channel, Tennis Channel, On Demand Sports, Esports, ESPN 1, 2, 3, and 4, and et cetera, those things hadn't existed. As, as that window widened, and there were more media outlets, the data became more complicated to figure out how we capture the audience that could spend the money. Um, and so being able to have a team of folks that gave us that data ended up being an incredibly powerful tool to then help us make the argument. It, it is an um, incredibly nebulous thing to price to say how much is, how much would it be worth if I had Microsoft on my chest here while you were all watching me and it was being televised, is there a value to that? And if so, how do you price it? The data was the ammunition, as it were, to be able for us to sit down with a sponsoring company, whether it was a Nike or Adidas or whether it was somebody outside of sports, like an, a Microsoft or a General Electric, that we would be mounting the argument with and showing the data because it was kind of next to impossible to attribute a value to something that was, frankly, not easily quantifiable. So, in, so we would use that data and the effects of it and all of the things that they could show in terms of the impressions it would get and who was watching it and if there was a, a resulting buying or clicking or click through that came through after it that would help us in the architecture of the deal. Um, and it, it, it also came into play, like I said, when we were producing events, whether it was a sports event or a movie launch or a book signing or even figuring out what the, um, what the advance would be on a particular athlete's autobiography, all of it based on the data of popularity, social media influence, and if there were direct links between when the particular uh, athlete tweeted out something and any resulting buys. And then at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the goal was to score that particular deal. Um, so again, I thought that it played in uh, quite well to the, the adage or the notion of analytics everywhere. Because, and I'm sure Mike will share with you, even going to sporting events now and seeing signage in a stadium, why it rotates, why it's placed a certain area, was all about the amount of impressions it would get, how much it would be on TV, who was watching it, the buying habits of who was watching it, and what the resulting click-through happened to be. So I, uh, 
I'm not one for super long presentations, so when I present, I tend to be pretty short. And I wanted to give you a flavor of it. I'm certainly happy to answer any questions you may have. But again, I want to also reiterate what I said this morning. Thank you for being here and for your support of the College of Business. We really appreciate it. Thank you.